Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. The goal of this segment is to give an overview of grill patterns using Katia, starting with a 2D sketch that is used to create a solid, which is patterned and finally mapped onto a more complex organically shaped surface. And the bonus is to visualize it at any given time without having to export or prep the data. The title of this overview is Using Katia for Grill Patterns. The list below shows the sequence of events we'll take from start to finish. This video was created using the 3D Experience platform, which is based on the V6 architecture. There are two roles being utilized here, MES, a mechanical design role, and CDT for transportation designers. Okay. With that introduction out of the way, let's get started. You're looking at a rectangular grill pattern, comprising a number of rows and columns. Let's peel it back and take a look at its underpinnings. In the lower right hand corner, there is a 2D sketch of a honeycomb shape. This shape is made of a series of lines and offsets with dimensions and constraints. By entering the sketch mode, we can take a closer look and see the dimensions and even modify them by clicking on their values. If you're familiar with the sketching tool, this is nothing new. But for the others, keep in mind that it's only necessary and also a best practice to create one quadrant of this shape. Because after we exit the sketch mode, the sketch output curves are mirrored up and down and side by side then projected onto, well in this case an angled plane, created for a shingling effect. Now if any of the sketch dimensions are modified, all the child elements will update to reflect the change. From the projected curve, we generate a solid, and from there build a pattern. As you can see, we already have one created, but let's open the hood and see what's inside. There are a few ways to define how the pattern is created. Here we have rows and columns defined by the first and second direction parameters. So the first direction is our horizontal column of 18. But notice how it's grayed out. This is because in Katia, an optional user defined parameter can drive this value. Why do this? Well, for one, it has the ability to change multiple dimensions to multiple features simultaneously. It's easy to find and can reduce human error. Now let's take a look at reference and construction geometry tied to our pattern. On the back side we have a reference surface. This is a simple extrusion generated from a line that is tied to the width of our honeycomb multiplied by the number of columns. The length is determined by the height multiplied by the number of rows. These values are assigned by formulas that reference our parameters. It may seem complex, but once you try it a few times, it makes perfect sense. If you want to learn more about parameterization in Katia, there are plenty of free tutorials out there. So now let's change the number assigned to a pair. First is our vertical count, reduced from 15 to 7. Then our horizontal count from 18 to 9. We update our part, and as expected, we have a smaller pattern. And take note of the reference surface and how it rebuilt. Okay, let's do an undo returning to the previous state. In the next step, we have a construction flange off the reference surface boundary. This flange is used to clean up our pattern with a trim operation, eliminating the honeycombs outside the border. Now we're ready to map our geometry using the wrap surface command. The selection sequence starts with the deformation element. This is our pattern. Next is the reference, which is our extrusion reference surface. And finally a target, which is the sculpted surface. After validating our inputs, the mapping is performed. The arrows are illustrating the relationship from reference to target. We'll come back to this momentarily. As we rotate the part, it's really cool to see the pattern morph onto our sculpted surface. And to me at least, it feels like a really good sense of accomplishment. Okay, let's screw around a little bit here, taking advantage of the parameters we showed earlier that are now expanding their reach to the mapping. 
So once again, I want to change the vertical and horizontal values. The update mode is changed to manual, and you can see the part turn red once the value change is made. Manual update is a good option for large models, and in this case, where I want to make more than one value change, it waits for me to decide when to execute the update. So until that point, I get a visual alert turning the geometry red. Now let's update our part and see what happens. Wow, so you can see that the new mapping has drastically changed, and that's because of the reference to target relationship you saw earlier. So in this case, since there are less honeycombs, they had to increase in size to fill the space of our target. If we toggle back and forth, you get an idea and a better sense of what just took place. Everything you saw up to this point can be accomplished in the mechanical design role, MES. Now let's add a bit more sophistication that you can achieve with the transportation designer role, CDT, which includes Katia Ison. Pay close attention to the morphed pattern as we zoom in. Notice the shape variations of the honeycombs themselves. And as we toggle back and forth, you can get a sense on how organic shapes can be created. So we're kind of varying the width of those honeycombs. To pull this off, it's necessary to add an extra layer of setup geometry before the final mapping exercise. The extra layer involves a couple interesting features in the Isom Shape Morphing app. Feature Modeling and Shape Mapping Feature modeling is used to sculpt feature-based geometry, such as a flange or maybe a surface blend, by use of control point manipulation. All the sculpting activity is then stored in the command and will update if a parent element is modified. So I choose the reference extrusion and the feature modeling surface is created. Now while still in the command, I am going to increase the order of the surface from 2 to 9. Orders are what make up a patch structure of a surface. A higher order surface gives it the ability to have a more complex shape. The original extrude was planar, so it only needed a minimum order of 2 in both U and V direction to be sufficiently described but we increase the order for a specific reason that you will see in a moment. Now we enter the modification tab where we have a control point dialog box. The first thing we want to do is set a mirror plane. So now I pull on the control point mesh lines, kind of crowding them to the outer boundary. Maybe space them out a little bit, making it a bit more uniform. And I'm happy to let Katia handle the other side. Okay, now we are ready to set up the first mapping exercise, utilizing the new feature modeling surface you just saw, and map it to the original target surface used earlier. This newly mapped surface will become our replacement target surface in the final mapping exercise. If you're confused at this point, don't worry, let it play out. This is where we use Isom shape mapping. This command has similar capabilities as the surface wrap shown earlier, but there are some trade-offs. GSD surface wrap is more robust with complex geometry and faster performing, while Isom shape mapping is better suited for Class A surfacing because it's more focused on optimizing things like orders and segmentation. So we'll utilize each for their strengths, leveraging both technologies for this operation. Okay, that was a mouthful. Let's do it. So we select our element to be deformed, the feature modeling surface. Next is the reference, which is the extrusion surface that is quite involved in both mappings, and our target. And our setup geometry is mapped. Take notice of the newly mapped surface's patch structure. It has more orders in the horizontal direction than the feature surface itself and this is expected because it needs to increase these orders to accommodate the complex shape change. The key here is the vertical order. Did you notice how they mimic the original surface? Do you see how they are still crowded to the outer boundary? And after fast forwarding past our second mapping using the surface wrap command, you can see the cool effects that are possible by incorporating both technologies. Remember, it all boils down to the element to be deformed and how it relates to its reference and target geometry. 
The mapping technology here takes into account not only the exterior shape of the inputs, but the interior structures, and that's how it's possible to play with the shapes. Now let's replace our target with this crazy surface. Remember, when doing a replace in Katia, any child element will be repointed to the replacement element, and that includes both mapping sequences. Now take a look at this beautiful creation. This is what gets a modeler excited. Let's do one more replacement with the surface taken from an actual car design that I have open in another tab and stored inside a product structure. Now let's toggle back to that product with the newly mapped grill and visualize it. This is the strength of using Katia on the 3D Experience platform. Both real-time visualization and ray trace modes are just a click away for quick reviews, and that helps you make good decisions, all without having to prep the data. Well, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this overview and look forward to creating more content in the near future. Thanks a lot.